Hey, Chaos West uh, people. We are now ready to perform our next talk, handed in by Freedom of Press. Three uh, amazing people will uh, explain everything you want to know about that. And um, I will just hand over to Freddy. Thank you very much. Go ahead. Go ahead. Um, good afternoon. Thank you for coming. Uh, I am just going to quickly introduce two of our amazing hackers, um, Loic Dakery and Eric Hartschucker. Uh, Hartschweiker. Um, they will be talking about SecureDrop. SecureDrop is a software platform that is maintained by Freedom of the Press Foundation. Um, it is a, a hardened whistleblowing platform. Uh, so it. Yeah, so we'll be talking about whistleblowing and uh, just the project. So I will hand it off to them. Cool. So this is going to be more of a high level talk on SecureDrop and its architecture and its use cases. And at the end, we'll have a Q&A session where you can ask us implementation questions about how we made certain decisions, what the threat model is and whatnot. So we'll start off with something a bit more high level. Um, Cool. So yeah, what you'll leave with is we're going to explain um, sort of the basics of what journalists have to deal with and how sources have to try to keep themselves anonymous in the modern world when it comes to leaking documents or even just anonymously submitting tips to journalists. Um, we're also going to give a more high level overview of the architecture. And we are an open source project and there's lots of ways to contribute. So we're going to discuss some of those things at the end. And we also, as the Freedom of the Press Foundation, will be um, discussing the future of how the American organization will be moving into Europe to sort of help with press freedom issues that Europeans face. So you guys might recognize some of these people, Jeremy Hammond, Chelsea Manning, Edward Snowden, as people who have leaked documents to um, sort of change the world in dramatic or less dramatic ways, depending you see it. And it's important that people are able to continue to leak classified information in a way that, they've, that keeps them safe. Unfortunately, that doesn't seem to be the reality of this, no pun intended, um, that we cannot provide safety in all times or anonymity to sources. So um, this is supposed to be a video, but I guess not. In the past, it was possible for um, journalists to just not say who their source was, and that was sufficient to protect someone's anonymity. Um, with the rise of global surveillance, that's actually not possible anymore. We know that metadata can tie individuals to each other, and so if a news story breaks, the government can go back and look at who contacted journalists, when that happened, and then build a case to identify which person was the source. So even if a journalist refuses to testify in court, either through you know, parallel construction or whatever other techniques they choose to use, it is not possible in every case the way it used to be for a journalist to protect a source. So, um, Oh man. Anyways, these slides are out of order. What I was getting at is uh, SecureDrop restores the possibility for uh, journalists to do through non-compliance um, something to protect the anonymity of their sources. So we have an architecture that primarily relies on using the Tor network to anonymize metadata and we encrypt the data as it transits to and from the servers and on the servers and we aim to minimize anything we log on the servers such as Apache access logs or timestamps on files on the file system or to you know not log user IDs and whatnot um, and we know this is a problem because we've seen current government administrations do make active efforts to de-anonymize sources and to go through records and to do sort of active spying on news organizations. So again, what SecureDrop does is it is physical servers that we expect each news organization to buy and set up in their property so that they have complete control of the hardware and they know what's happening to them. We actually usually ask them to put the 
physical servers and the firewalls inside their newsroom in a high traffic area where there will always be people around it, which makes it less likely that somebody walks into a supply closet, unplugs it, or sticks in a bad USB and breaks everything. Um, this also is very important because if you, say, used Amazon and tossed your stuff in the cloud, you would now have all of your encryption keys in the cloud. You would know that somebody could steal your onion, um, onion address private key. Somebody could look at the network traffic unencrypted, and or they could just grab the entire hard drive out of there. And you, as a administrator of a secure drop instance, would not know that happened. So it's very important that we have these physically located in the newsrooms. Um, because of the nature of how Onion services work, we do get end-to-end -end encryption from the sources Tor browser to the journalist's secure drop instance. And it is possible also we advertise the journalist's public key on secure drop. So if a user is more tech savvy, they could encrypt the documents or messages locally, then send them through to get guaranteed end-to-end -end encryption from the source all the way to the journalist, including through the secure drop servers themselves. Um, if somebody is not tech savvy enough to set this up, when the files are streamed in or the data is streamed in, we run it through GPG and write the files to disk encrypted so that they never are written to disk in an unencrypted state. And again, this is being quite paranoid. We expect it to not be the case that somebody will physically come into the office and take the hard drives out. But that does happen. So for, for instance, it was the Guardian after the Snowden leaks actually had GHCQ come into their offices and raid their offices and force them to destroy their hard drives. So it is a real risk, even in what we think to be a more democratic Western society. Um, again, as mentioned, through using Tor and careful being careful about what we log and not using you know usernames that users can choose themselves and assigning them random usernames we minimize the possibility that metadata will de-anonymize them even if the documents themselves would not and this is all again wrapped on top of a relatively hardened linux installation so we take base ubuntu and we install a whole bunch of packages to help minimize the possibility that it gets hacked. So one of the big ones we use is we use GR security and PAX control to try to restrict um, the processes themselves so that if somebody is able to get a small amount of exploit, we limit the damage or possibly keep it isolated to just a single process. And another thing we think is very important about building secure software is being free, Libra, open source, so that you yourself could take this and you can modify it if you believe you have more expertise than we do. We also have, it's a bug bounty, it is a bug bounty program, so you can look at the source code, you can set secure drop up yourself in a virtual machine, you can test it, you can exploit it if you think you can, and we will work with you to make changes to help ensure other people's security. Um, and like a brief history of Secure Drop, how it came into existence. Also, it was started by the late Aaron Swartz in 2012 with Kevin Polson from Wired. Wired, yep. And there was a project they worked on together and it was first installed um, back then with only a single news organization. It was released under the AGPL license and it's currently maintained by nine of us, plus various members of the community, former contributors still you come back, former employees from the FPF sometimes come back, and maybe we have hackathons some weekends, and so there actually are like possibly another hundred contributors we could put up there, but this is the core team, and these two guys down here who were all on stage a second ago are also major contributors to this. So, man, these are definitely out of order. Anyways, um, Way back when, The New Yorker was the first news organization to install this, and now we have something like 80 installations of it. We have a whole bunch in the U.S., a handful of started appearing in Europe. We, in Germany, uh, Heise? Yeah, Heise is the only news organization in Germany that has a secure drop instance, and um, we're hoping to expand that and get more news organizations using this because we really do believe it's one of very few number of tools that can actually protect sources who are engaging in whistleblowing. Um, so this goes back to another problem. So this is a very technical, very hackery, Linuxy fun project, but 
the average person working for a government agency might not have the ability to just spontaneously stumble across this. So we encourage news organizations to advertise this themselves through different ways. So sometimes it's simple on a, oh man, bad formatting. Anyways, you can see down here, it says secure drop on the bottom. It's the front page of their newspaper. They list a link to their onion address and or sorry, a link list to their landing page, which explains how to download Tor browser, how to find, um, like verify it, how to get to get the onion address in there and why it needs to be used the way it is. It also usually lists their public key. Yeah, bad formatting. Um, sometimes also they will take out uh, ads in the physical papers or they'll put ads on social media. And again, this is the intercept. This is their main page. They have a link to become a source down in the bottom. And this is an example landing page explaining how to get Tor Browser, how SecureDrop works, and sometimes we'll even link to um, maybe documentation about the basics of using it, or they'll have some screenshots showing them what to expect before they really get into this process. And one thing that's important about this is the idea of maybe call it herd immunity. So if you have one source and that is the only person using Tor in a given city, it's pretty obvious that if a leak comes out of that city and it went to secure drop, it happened from that one person. So it actually is very important that all of you using, you know, Reddit or whatever Stack Overflow actually use Tor browser for this because your traffic hides other people's traffic. And so the more people who use Tor daily, the more like the less likely it is that somebody who's using Tor for something like leaking or has a very strong need for anonymity it's less likely they'll get caught. So very much encourage you to use Tor day to day if you can. Um, so now a little bit more into how Secure Drop actually works. So we start off setting up um, a server behind a firewall in a news organization. And this server only runs as an onion service. We The firewall blocks off all incoming traffic and we expect a source to connect to it through the network. Um, the source will take some documents or some messages and, um, oh man, the land on the page, they will see this is roughly what the landing page looks like these days and they have the opportunity to submit documents. They will be assigned a random code name. This code name will allow them to log back in in the future and it moves the Tor network with end and encryption through onion services to the secure drop server. The secure drop server encrypts them with PGP and then stashes them for later and notifies the journalists. Um, cool. So the way the journalists get this stuff back is the journalists will then, um, using a Tails-based system, will log in to a journalist interface and see a list of um, See a list of sources. Sources are assigned a random adjective, random noun username so that this, the journalists can keep track of who they are and you know, for sharing with other journalists when they get these documents. They will download the documents to an external USB, transfer this external USB to an air-gapped laptop that contains the private keys and the private keys can then decrypt the devices. So like this whole air gap process is itself a little bit cumbersome, but it does provide an extra layer of security. And we figure since the kind of documents secure drop specifically tries to protect our classified information, government leaks, interests of p potential national impact. And if those are the documents you're leaking and those are the adversaries you have, you can assume that they do have the capability to break a lot of the things that we have hardened against in ways that we haven't yet discovered through zero day exploits and whatnot. So by taking the private key information and air gapping it and trying to encourage like good practices with how we transfer documents off of the machines that connect to the internet onto the air gap devices, it does help minimize the possibility of exfiltrating data, specifically the private keys or any way of de-anonymizing users. Um, Yep, we covered all that. Okay. 
think that covers the actual leaking step. So this is the current architecture diagram of how SecureDrop works. And you can see that it is kind of complicated. So again, a source up in the top left will read the doc leak the document down to the application servers. The application server is monitored by a monitoring server that does OSSEC checks against it for integrity to try to alert administrators and journalists if there's been a breach. Um, then the journalist downloads it again back to the Tor network using another Onion service, puts it on USB, transfers it to the offline air-gapped thing, and then from there we'll work on publishing it if they verify the documents are something worth investigating. So this is kind of messy, and it's something we're trying to work on in the future. We do have a lot of work of going into this for switching to cubes. So if cubes interest you, we have a lot of work on that, and some of the guys down the front can talk to you about this after the presentation. Yes, again, how you can help. So one thing that has been really important the last year is um, Loic has been had the spearhead on localizing secure drops. So for from 2012 until about maybe midway through this year, we only had English as the single language. Now we have fully translated Arabic, German, Norwegian, French, Chinese. What else? Polish. Okay, there's, I don't think we Spanish, yeah, there's a lot. And we have partial translations for a lot of these. Um, this is actually one of the easiest ways to contribute. There's a very nice web interface and you can just go in and if you speak any languages besides English, you can, we'll present you a string. It will say like, hello, welcome to search, secure drop. And then you just type in the exact same string in your native language. It's extremely simple and it's, you know, pretty low workload if you're interested in doing this. So if you would like to talk to us about localization afterwards, Yes, really, we're very interested in that. Um, we've, been, oops, we've been working with uh, Localization Lab. So if anybody from Localization Lab is here, no. Yeah, awesome, great. So thank you for your assistance. We, this is something that we've struggled with for a long time and we're like very, very appreciative of the help. Again, out of order slides. So the other major ways to help with secure drop is with documentation to help journalists understand how to use it and how to help server administrators set this up because currently the install process does include configuring firewalls, doing manual Linux configuration, running a bunch of Ansible scripts and whatnot and can be complicated. So if you are a technical writer, we would love assistance with that as well. And um, yeah, in general, just get in touch. Like, this is something that's very welcoming of the community. So I'm gonna pass this off to Loic right now. He's gonna talk a bit about the Free the Press Foundation in Europe and sort of, yeah. You know what to do. Yep. Um, so there has been questions about uh, why secure drop is necessary instead of having just an HTTPS to leak information. And the, the gist of it is that you need to leak classified information. And the reason is when, when you work, when there is a country with an intelligence agency, there cannot be any oversight body. A lot of countries have oversight bodies, but they are a joke. It's, they are appointed by the government to oversee the intelligence agency, which is appointed by the government. So it's the right hand controlling the left hand. It does not work. The only way it works is when employees or contractors of the intelligence agencies are courageous enough to leak information when they witness something that goes against the general public interest. And since they are the only control mechanism, uh, they need to exist now and for a very, very long time. It's not like it's a pirate thing to do, illegal thing to do. The lawmakers agree that you need that kind of control and that there is no other way. To the point that a coalition of nonprofit organizations uh, went together and in 2013 published the Chuan Principles, which explain why uh, leaking 
classified documents, classified information in the context of national security is needed. But it's not just a group of NGO who did that. It's also the Council of Europe who supports this document. And so they, they carry some weight. Uh, you can hope that one day we will have directives protecting whistleblowers. But unfortunately, it's still being discussed now. As you may know, uh, in October 2017, there has been uh, a report voted by the European Parliament, a vast majority, asking for a directive to protect whistleblowers in general, not just uh, those leaking classified information. Unfortunately, this report is very good for whistleblowers in general, but says very little about those involved with uh, classified documents. So for the time being, the situation in Europe is that we have to wait maybe for a decade or two for that kind of legislation to happen. In the meantime, it is up to us to provide tools like SecureDrop so these uh, whistleblowers can be protected by preserving their anonymity. That's the only thing they have. And now in Europe, unfortunately, only these countries have sacred drop. So the, uh, the rest of the countries do not yet have that. You have one intelligence agency per country, at least. So you, you should be able, if you live in a country, you're an employee of this intelligence agency, you should be able to reach out to a, an investigative journalist that you know because uh, he or she wrote articles about this subject and you trust this person to follow up on the important revelation that you have. But you also need to be protected which is currently the case only if you live in these countries. And here comes the investigative journalist paradox. So this is, in my view, the reason why I, it only exists in these few countries. If you go to an investigative journalist and you ask them how far are you willing to go to protect your sources, they will anonymously say, as far as it takes, and if national security or classified documents are involved, I'm ready to do whatever it takes to protect them. And then if you ask them, because they, they know about inf uh, InfoSec and whatnot, if you ask them what they think of SecureDrop, all of them will tell you that's the best tool there is. There is nothing better to protect sources and trusted with uh, classified documents. And then the third question with, where comes the paradox is, what are you doing yourself now to protect that kind of sources to make it possible for them to come to you? And the answer is, in most cases, I, I don't do anything. I don't have access to sacred drop. So to their credit, uh, before 2017, it was not localized, and it was kind of difficult to find a geek nearby to help you technically set up that. But it's no longer true. So in Europe, what we're going to do in the next year and more is to go and travel to every uh, European country where there is not a secret drop yet and try to find at least one journalist who would be willing to use it, who values the tool but says, oh, I don't use it because, well, it's a little bit too complicated. Let me show you how it works. Oh, yes, but it's too expensive to install. But we establish a nonprofit that will pay for these fees, and it's not much. It's a few hundred euros per year. Oh, yes, but you need someone to maintain that uh, yeah, but we have volunteers also. And maybe if we don't have volunteers, we can go and look for funding. So you, investigative journalist, you can do your work. Because as you may know, investigative journalists do not really uh, have a lot of money to spend. 
And so that's what uh, a narrow view, but an important one about what um, freedom of the press foundation in Europe will be in the next year. Uh, and that's the thanks. And now we can, we have a few minutes for questions if you have some. And contact information for all of us. If you're lazy, you can just scan the QR codes. Also, if Especially looking forward to technical questions because that's what I would really like to talk about. But whatever you guys are interested in, anyone? Oh wait, hang on. So, so the question was, how does the air gapping look like? Um, it is a. So we recommend you take like a you know. ThinkPad or something like that. Remove all the physical speakers and the webcam and things like that um and but the air the private keys are an encrypted tails um live distro um so when you want to decrypt documents you move them from the journalist interface into the what we call the secure viewing station um and then you have the private key there that will be able to decrypt the documents. So even if in the, that whole big model, even if any part of that is exploited, you still have your private keys like on an encrypted disk. Um, so that's one of the things that we do. And the last one I built was a BRICS, 130 euro. And you, uh, a BRICS is a kind of cube. Um, it, runs, it has a Celeron in it, so it's really cheap. And you have a Wi-Fi component that you can unscrew, so you remove it. And you have a RG45 uh, port that you can glue with epoxy. So the journalist is not tempted uh, by accident to plug something in. And then you, you make it air gap. It has uh, audio, and, uh, but it does not have speakers. So you do not need to remove the speakers. It has audio uh, input and output. But if the jacks are not plugged in, there is no signal, and there you have the air gap, the cheapest air gap I was able to, to build. So we do have one problem with the air gap, is that uh, the current instructions tell a journalist to use, reuse the same USB for transferring documents multiple times, which is problematic, and we know that. And ideally, the best way to do it would be to actually use, to burn CDs and move them one way only, because they're you could write once and you couldn't get information back off. Uh, we've also had a problem recently. There was um, an exploit that went out in the wild this summer about somebody who found a way to um, abuse Nautilus to allow arbitrary Python code to execute. And they were creating um, open office documents with QR codes that contained private key material. And w journalists were scanning these and then pinging a URL and exfiltrating private key material through a URL. So like the air gap itself is problematic, which is why we're moving to cubes, because then the air gap matters less because your private key material will not be on the same uh, VM as the place where you like open documents, run documents and whatnot. And so it, there is some more sane way for us to handle that. But like the current air gap architecture was the best we could do at the time. And we're moving away from that in the future. Did that sufficiently answer your question? Yeah. So his question was, why do we not use a one-way high-speed serial interface to transfer data because of the problems we just mentioned with USBs? And I would think realistically that isn't a way to solve it in the future. But I think when this first happened, it was you know one or two people working on the project and pushing this out to journalists who had to maintain it themselves, their actual instances, and I think that would be overly complicated. And once you get too complicated, you actually get worse security properties because somebody will make a mistake because of the complexity. And I believe that was why the decision was made like a long time ago. But yeah, next question. Saw someone, yo. Yeah. 
So the question is, do we do anything with collected c collections? Um, no. So we do the technical infrastructure, um, and we provide things like assistance and uh, support and things like that. Um, but we, uh, we, our job is to help the journalists do their job, you know, their job, and we don't want to know. So even. Uh, Paradoxically, even us who work at Freedom of the Press Foundation don't know if a story came through SecureDrop or not. Um, uh, Hartsucker had a slide that showed, you know, some. Sometimes people would advertise, uh, but we kind of don't want to know. Um, and also, there are legal reasons why we, as a foundation, would not want to um, even, you know, know that something came through SecureDrop. So we kind of try to wall off in that way as well. Does, does that make sense? Yeah. I mean, the thing too is we actually don't have access to any of the servers running SecureDrop. What we do is we find an admin at a given news organization and we work with them and help them install it. But we never have access to any of the SecureDrop instances ourselves. So we actually could not get the documents if we wanted to, which we see as very advantageous because then that would cause us to be the single point of failure in a like decentralized network of many secure drop instances running on their own. So even if we wanted to, we definitely cannot get the documents. Uh, so the f question was, why do we not pair up with the Internet Archive? Yeah. I'm sorry. Please repeat. <laughs> it's me, the stage yeah. manager. Yo. Do you uh, want us to repeat his question or? Yes, please repeat the question. Actually, do you just want to give him your mic? That would might be faster. <laughs> um, so, um, my, my question is. Um, Thanks. Have you thought of maybe pairing up with a um, large institution that collects this information so that all of the press has access to it, so that we don't get one press that tells the story, which might then be biased? Um, like, for example, the Internet Archive, that it tries to stay neutral on all causes? Sort of. I mean, I. Okay, so the question of like democratize, democratizing the access is a really important one. Um, it's it's com complex because we have to reach out to we try to reach out to people and say this is a thing, um, and your news organization definitely needs it. Um, and so s the installations are often mixed. So sometimes it'll be, you know, one journalist at a news organization who does all the work. Sometimes they will be um, an editor who, for example, will log in and distribute sources, uh, material, uh, stories to, to their uh, journalists. Sometimes it'll be like the parent company of a conglomerate. Um, so uh, it might be the case that it goes not to one news organization, but a family of them. Um, so that's a thing um, that the, then there's another kind of um, tool that we're working on uh, for um, working with archives that uh, like in, and how do you share an archive between multiple news organizations or multiple journalists in a, in a secure way. Um, so that's another tool that we're kind of working on, um, but that it's it's a bit complex to answer that issue because we are basically at the will of other news organizations that w and how they want to work. Um, so the best that we can do is, you know, advertise and let people know that this is a thing um, and meet them wherever they are. Does that? Yeah. Anyone else? Cool. Okay, I guess we're done. Yeah.
And so, yeah, I do have uh, at the end. Uh, I always have a few questions. Oh, cool. At uh, first, uh, my apologies. I was uh, messed up in some stage manager stuff. They had. So um, I really liked your talk, and um, as soon as I have some time, I would like to talk in private with you. Where do I find you guys? Uh, we don't have a table, actually. What? We do. Oh, apparently we have a table by IP2, R2P. Oh, that's just behind the stage, right? Like a little to the left. Okay, cool. I hope I get the time because I have a. I would like to use. A, a, it's gonna be amazing. <laughs> thanks again. Cool. Yeah. Thanks for asking for a talk. Also, thank you for attending and thank you for providing a space for us. You're more than welcome. <laughs>